Now it is my pleasure to introduce Ralph Brown. Uh, he is a professor of sociology and the faculty coordinator for the international development minor at BYU. And he is also the executive director, director and treasurer of the Rural Sociological Society. Um, Dr. Brown is a rural sociologist by training with expertise in rural, agricultural, and community development. He worked on USAID projects upon completing his PhD, one in Kenya and one in Indonesia. He speaks fluent in Indonesian and Malay and is conversant in Thai and can get into trouble in Cambodian, but not out. His research is centered on applied research and assessment, community satisfaction, and attachment in rural communities, um, and on change in rural development, both in the US and in Southeast Asia. Current research foci include the social and economic impacts of the emerging motorcycle economies of Southeast Asia and the declines in community and friendship attachment in liquid modernity. Dr. Brown received his bachelor's um, and master's in sociology from Utah State University and a PhD from University of Missouri, Columbia. And now, Dr. Brown. So while Peter's helping me get this up and running, a few caveats, which is great French word for warnings. Um, yes. Oh, do I have to use this? Bummer. Okay. Yeah, better. See, Peter's got a better point. Thank you, sir. All right, a couple of caveats. For those of you who are compelled to be here, I'm sorry. I know I've personally voted against that plan in the pre-existence, but uh, here you are. Um, so, and for the, rows, the rest of you who came for some deep intellectual experience, again, I'm sorry. That's not what this is going to be, okay? So, let's see where this could take us. Let's try this. So, <laughs> the title to my uh, Remarks today is exposing yourself. Thank you, great anteater. Why we need more and better world citizens and how serious international exposure facilitates this. I just thought it was a great picture. Okay, for some of you who've already seen these, just hang with me. First off, as a sociologist, one of the things that I take as an axiom is that things are not always as they seem. For example, some things don't really make sense um, the closer you look at them. For example, a paradox. Everybody knows what a paradox is, right? It's two doxes, okay? The classic paradox is Parmenides is a man from the island of Crete, and Parmenides was once quoted as saying, all Cretans are liars all of the time. It's okay? Any problems with that? Actually, you, are, you guys are gonna have to participate with this, okay? So, yeah, polite chuckles work. All right, so, first things first, if you get the joke, you know, that actually came after that, but, uh, Anyway, first things first, common sense, not always that common, nor does it always make sense. So let's look at a couple of examples. Bridge out, open to local traffic. I have no idea how to interpret this. <laughs> Family market custom killing. Unfortunately, families are forever. And in the LDS case, you know, with our families, beware of children. I like this one, police station, toilet stolen, cops have nothing to go on. <laughs> Subtle, but effective. <laughs> also in the line of subtle, but effective. <laughs> okay. Two options to expand in your mind. College or weed, choose wisely. Subtle, less effective. And my all-time favorite. <laughs> okay. Somewhere in Utah Valley, Satan's Kingdom, State Recreation Area. Spay or neuter your best friend. 
Also in the category of strange with no explanation. <laughs> Probably in Florida. Mm. Okay. <laughs> and then finally, emergency, 174 kilometers ahead, <clears throat> just in case. You know, if it wasn't kilometers, I'd swear it was Wyoming. But. And sometimes we just lose the message for another message. Also, the bridge is out ahead. So in my discipline, we have this thing called the Hawthorne Effect. And in World War II, when bombers, B-17 bombers, were dropping bombs across Europe and Japan, they kept getting uh, blown out of the sky. And so there was a very real need to make sure that we were producing bombers as quickly as possible so that we could replace the ones that were being knocked out of the air. There is a place called the White Westinghouse Electric Hawthorne Plant outside of Chicago. A very famous organizational sociologist by the name of Elton Mayo if you ever go into any kind of things with organizational behavior in business schools, you'll hear his name all the time. He's kind of like the godfather of uh, organizational theory. They hired Elton Mayo and his crew to show up to the White Westinghouse Hawthorne plant and try to figure out how to make things move faster. And what the White Westinghouse plant did was create a dashboards. They would wire the dashboards for the B-17s. So Mayo and his buddies all show up, they have white, um, lab coats on and a clipboard, and they go into a room of workers and they would lower the heat. Guess what, what, what happened to productivity? Up or down? Went up. So then they raised the heat. What happened to productivity? Went up. They put fewer people in a room. What happened to productivity? It went up. They put less people in a room. Guess what happened to productivity? Went up. Anything and everything they did, for the most part, productivity went up. Why? It's where you guys participate. They were yeah, they knew they were being watched. And they had a good idea what the investigators wanted, right? And so they made it happen. We call this a self-fulfilling prophecy in, uh, in sociology. There's a really famous sociologist by the name of W.I. Thomas. And he has this dictum. He says, what's perceived to be real will be real in its consequences. In essence, we make it happen, a self-fulfilling prophecy. <coughs> And sure enough, anything and everything they did in the White Westinghouse plant, productivity went up. How many of you ever lied on a survey? How many of you are lying now? <laughs> okay, I mean, you, you start gaming the survey and then, oh, I know what they really want. Yes, I robbed 15 old ladies in a liquor store last week, kind of a thing, okay? And so we start thinking that we know what's going on. A really good survey, researcher can construct a survey that can figure out if you're trying to game the system. Um, that's why everybody and their dog thinks that they can do a survey, and actually it's kind of an interesting craft. But one of the things we're trying to do is get rid of this, this Hawthorne effect. When I was in junior high, back when you know everyone's in junior high, is uh, walking bags of hormones with no brain cells. My wife teaches junior high, and I believe everybody who teaches junior high should be sainted by some religion. Um, we used to think this was fun. Somebody would come in and we would gang up on him. We'd say, Bob, Bob, you look sick. I'm fine. Next person, Bob, you really look sick. I'm okay. Third person, Bob, you look really sick. Bob, by this point in time, is starting to look sick. By the th fourth or fifth person, Bob has puked on his shoes and gone home. We used to think that was fun, okay? Um, but that was long before I actually knew there was a name we could give this, the Hawthorne Effect. Now we just call it that, and it's kind of fun. I'm going to give you two different words here, context and perception. And I want you to tell me, how do the two affect each other? Really fast, what do you think? First off, what's context? Really loud. Yeah, what surrounds an event or, or a scene or whatever. It's, it's everything going on around. How about perception? What's your thoughts on that? Hint. Awesome. Way to go. Way to take that hint. Okay. So I already did that. So I'm going to I'm going to show you something, and I'm going to ask you what you see. I'm going to show you an old satellite photo. For those of you who've seen this, be quiet for a while. Okay. Um, old satellite photo. We have Google Earth now. We don't have these grainy, rotten photos that uh, we used to have. 
So I want you to tell me if the dark areas are land or if they're water. What do you think? Where's that little pointer thing? That wasn't it. it made a funny noise. Right here? Top one? Oh, right here. That's not it. That didn't work at all. Okay, never mind. Here. No, it doesn't matter. Let's go back. So this right here, is that water? What if I were to tell you this was Utah Valley? Where's BYU's campus? Take a guess. Here, 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 here. Pretty crappy photo, right? Anybody see anything else? Maybe something that should be found on a farm? Notice the ingenious highlighting. Anybody see a cow's head? Here's the right ear of the cow, forehead of the cow, left ear of the cow, cow's left eye, nostrils. Anybody not see the cow head? You can admit it if you don't. I showed this once at a class I was teaching at Mississippi State, and some student said, it's a frog. I said, it's not a frog. <laughs> it is most decidedly a cow, okay? So everybody see the cow? Now, if I gave you a different context, and your perception was looking for something that would fit that context. How many of you are actually looking for BYU? Sorry. Not only are you compelled to be here, forced, even though you voted against the plan, I lied to you, okay? <coughs> Which was part of that plan, evidently. Okay, cow's right eye. Now, I'm going to show you a different picture, and I want you to look at the context, examine it, and then I want you to think about where the action is occurring, and how do you know that? How are they dressed, and what does that tell you about the context? And then, what's their emotional state? Any guesses? Don't want to spend too much time on this. My guess is he's praying to the goddess of discus throwers. Okay, here's the discuses down here. What are they wearing? Flannel shirts, so it's gotta be in Vermont somewhere, okay? Um, do these look heavy? What's the look on their face? Yeah, yeah, like they're praying. What about this, what, what are they standing on? Scaffolding, where do you find scaffolding? Generally, besides in your front room. Construction site. So what might be going on in a construction site that would explain what's happening in this picture? <laughs> Too much time, here we go. <laughs> it's a pane glass window. These are suction cups. And this guy is steady in the top of the window. And the picture is taken through it. Do you see it now? So if we had more time, we would let you work through all of that, and you would come up with the ingenious account that, hey, it's a construction site, and that's a pane glass window, and those are suction cups, and it's heavy, and that guy's steady in it. But in the meantime, I just gave you all those hints. How about this one? Woof. It's a dash hound in a bunch of leaves. Peter, which one is that button again? This? Oh, yeah, there we go, thanks. See the dash hound? It's just a bad picture. You've all seen this when they took a bunch of psychology freshmen at a university. We know more about psychology freshmen than any other group of people on the face of the earth. You know, so they took them and divided into threes. A third, these were all guys. They showed young, voluptuous women. A third, they showed um, older women, and a third, they sh didn't show any pictures. And then they showed these pictures to each group, and the group that saw the young women, they saw a young woman in these two pictures. The group that saw old women, they tended to see an old woman, and the group that saw neither tended to be mixed. Can you guys see both the old and the young woman? If not, for another time. So, perception is this whole issue of where you're standing, how, what's your point of view? Um, it's both metaphorical as well as literal, I'd like to make a point on. And perception is influenced by your context. M.C. Escher, um, one of the most creative artists around, I think, and his anti-gravitational 
artwork. If you notice the way the water is flowing up. Lennon never, never made such a great shot in his life. And again, it's just, again, perception, where you're standing, your point of view. The queen's looking mighty fine. How many feet? The long arm and the law. <laughs> so the question is, are perceptions real? W.I. Thomas's dictum, what's perceived to be real will be real and its consequences. How about this? Phony cheerleader pleads guilty. Colorado Springs, a 26-year-old man who masqueraded as a female cheerleader at a high school pleaded guilty yesterday to criminal impersonation. Okay. Doherty kept up with the ruse for eight days, dressing with the cheerleading squad and claiming to be a transfer student from Greece. Who officials were suspicious and found the computer records he presented were false. There's all of his uh, sentencing stuff. A 16-year-old student who befriended Doherty after he enrolled in September said some students had doubts. He wore women's business suits, blazers and skirts, high heels. He had a lot of makeup on. It looked like it was plastered. He had makeup where his beard would be. And then the catcher, Doherty said after the hearing he wants to get a high school diploma and become a psychologist. Now, is Doherty a man or a woman? This is where you guys participate. A man, for eight days, what was he? A woman, okay. So perception matters, does it not? In this case, it was a short-lived perception. So a way to think about perception is through the metaphor of lenses. Lenses distort things. That's their job. They can either make you see things more clearly or they can make you see things less clearly. But anything that goes through a lens distorts the reality and you see something different. Nicolas Cage, John Lennon, and some unnamed hoser. Okay? So let's take the metaphor of lenses. Each subsequent lens changes what you see. Here's some of my lenses. I'm, I'm an American, I'm male, and bald, by choice, I like to claim. Six foot five, educated, I think, Mormon and a sociologist. Every one of those is a lens, and every one of those changes my perception about the world. And anytime I find myself in a different context, those lenses are always gonna come into play. I can't necessarily take those lenses off, is what I'm saying. It goes even further than that. Um, <clears throat> one of the most famous theories about linguistics is called the Sapir-Whorf theory. Sapir went on to a good career, Worf starred in a Star Trek movie, but here's what we end up with. It's really kind of a cool argument. Human beings do not live in the objective world alone, nor alone in the world of social activity as ordinarily understood, but are very much at the mercy of the particular language which has become the medium of expression for their society. In other words, your language gives you both a context and a perception. How many of you know another language besides profanity? Awesome. Um, shout out some of the languages that you know. French, what else? Welsh? Hawaiian? Romanian? Spanish? Thai? Now, each one of these languages, are there concepts that can be expressed in those languages that fundamentally do not exist? They can't even be conjured up in English. And vice versa. Do those concepts exist, even if English can't tap into them? Yeah, of course they do. But do they exist in English? No. And so if your context limits you to that language and that language only, it is also limiting to you, you to what an English speaker can experience about the world. Does that make sense? So there's an old joke. What do you call a person who speaks two languages? Bilingual. What do you call a person who only speaks one? An American. OK. Not so true here at BYU, fortunately. <laughs> um, a book re recently published here in 2010 through the language glass, Why the World Looks Different in Other Languages, really interesting example, German and Spanish. The word bridge is either um, in, in German, female, okay, or in Spanish, male. And if you start looking at how bridges are actually conceived and constructed in German versus in Spanish-speaking context, there's a very real difference. In Germany, bridges are sleek, thin, 
and very, um, um, what's the good word I'm looking for? Um, yeah, that'll work. And, and bridges in, in Spanish-speaking countries tend to be very masculine, thick, bulky, okay? Um, just one really quick example. Lenses, perspective, um, they give us a way of seeing the world, of interpreting a context through a particular perspective. But it's not just, they don't just give us an attitude. There's more to it than that. Um, they shape what we desire, they shape what we avoid, and they also shape what we fear. So how can you change your paradigm? if you are uh, looking for a change for a paradigm. So uh, uh, Einstein, a problem can never be solved on the same level of thinking that identified it. Let's give you an example. What do we fear? Let's start with that. And why do we fear it? And why do we fear what we don't know or understand? A classic example, 2002, the DC snipers. In 2002, the fall, 2002, Lee Boyd Malvo, John Allen Mohammed got in the back of a 1960-something Buick. Now, if you guys know what a 1960 Buick is, you could land aircraft on the hood. That's what these things looked like. They took the uh, keyhole out of the back of the trunk so they could put a sniper rifle through the keyhole, and they randomly picked off 10 people, killed 10, and wounded three. They tended to be at gas stations and home depots. Schools shut down. Football game stopped, and you know, in DC, if a football game stops, this is serious stuff. Why? 10 people, how many people die on the highway on any given day on the Washington Beltway? I don't know, but it's probably close to 10 people. Why did life stop for the DC snipers? It was an absolute panic. People wouldn't go outside. Let me give you an example here. These are your chances of being killed in America by an event in 2001, being killed by a terrorist attack, one in 100,000. Homicide victim, one in 14,000. Suicide, one in 9,200. Riding in a car, one in 6,500. Pneumonia, one in 4,500. How many of you, when you get into a car, are absolutely freaked that you're going to die? Why not? You have a far better chance of getting into a car and dying than being picked off by the DC sniper in 2002. Why did people just not stop driving? I mean, why didn't they just stop driving? What's the difference? Natalie? Yeah, they couldn't explain what was happening. It was random. It was not rational. It was something that was so far out of the realm of what should be explained or could be explained that it just totally freaked everyone out. What about pneumonia? Why aren't we all in a panic about pneumonia? I say as I'm coughing. <coughs> Why doesn't that scare us to death? Pun intended. Yeah, we think we understand it. Where do we get pneumonia? Hospitals. Ouch. Okay, so fear. I think fear is one of the things that absolutely colors our perception more than anything else. We live, I believe, in a context of fear. And I want to explain why, and I want to explain, move this into a discussion about international, okay? For many of the unknown, the unpredictable, it's created a world of fear. World's a scary place, be careful out there, the world an evil place, blah, 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 in Thai, fish, 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 okay? Um, I took my wife to Jordan with me last February. And everybody in our world, oh, be careful, oh, be careful. So have you ever been to Jordan? No, too scary. Have you ever been out of Springville? <laughs> oh, too scary, okay? I'm the guy in my high priest group that stands up for the world. I'm the guy that when they say the world's an horrible, awful place, I say, well, as the duly self-appointed representative of the world, I'm offended. <laughs> and say, no, it's not that bad, okay? For example, here is an American's concept of Europe. <laughs> Socialist Union, commies, buffer zone, Thanksgiving meal, smelly people, okay? Let me show you how this works. I actually put this to pen and paper once for my high priest group because I got so sick and tired of this. So here's what I did. I said if there's seven billion some odd people in the world, 
and there are 86,400 seconds in a day. If we take the 24-hour news channels, which have been a scourge on humanity, my personal opinion, because you've got to fill that 24 hours with something, okay? <clears throat> and let's take the old adage that everybody gets their 15 seconds of fame. So there's 7 billion people in the world, 86,400 seconds in the world, divided by 15, that gives you 5,760 people who can get their 15 seconds of fame in a 24-hour news cycle. Make sense so far? That means if you divide this number by the number of people in the world times 100, you have a point zero 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 eight one seven percent chance of something bad enough happening to you to make it on CNN or Fox News. I'll take those odds. You good with those odds? So why are we so worried that the world is so awful and horrible? Those are pretty good odds. I'll take those odds any day, even if they're in Windover. Okay, so we have a scripture in the, in the Mormon faith. It says, if you're prepared, you shall not fear. Well, prepared how? Or knowledge of what? I'm gonna play a little skit here. Let's see if this will work. So in the Mormon faith tradition, I think the world is glorious, okay? You can read the rest. You could even hum if you want. Um, I'm not gonna sing it. But um, we tend to walk around with this world chip on our shoulders, that the world is horrible and awful, and everything is bad, is out, out there somewhere. And almost everything we do and say reinforces that. What if we were to change that around and think the world is glorious, or that it's just awesome, okay? A couple of quotes from some rather famous Mormons. This one is by <coughs> um, blah, 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 President John Tanner. In regard to our religion, I will say that it encompasses, embraces every principle of truth and intelligence pertaining to us as moral, intellectual, mortal, and immortal beings pertaining to this world and the world that has come. Here's the point. We are open to truth of every kind, no matter whence it comes, where it originates, or who believes in it. Okay? And then it is the duty of all intelligent beings who are responsible and amenable to God for their acts to search after truth and to permit to inf and permit it to influence them and their acts. Okay. Brigham Young, our religion measures, weighs, and circumscribes all the wisdom in the world. All that God has ever revealed to man, God has revealed all the truth that is now in the possession of the world, whether it be scientific or religious. So back to the argument of perspective. This is a picture of a strangler fig in Cambodia. Same tree, different perspective. And that's my nephew standing by it, <laughs> okay? Where you stand metaphorically and literally is going to influence what you see. So it depends on your point of view. Let me give you a couple of really quick examples. Here are some things we're sure about as regards Muslims. This was found in the Washington Post, April 1st, 2011. These are five myths about American Muslims. None of them are right, but they're things that every American seems to know about Muslims. How about this one about Mormons? You'll look at that list and you'll find it far more easier to digest. What? Okay. So what's the difference between knowing this list and the list that preceded it? You guys are Mormons for the most part, I'm imagining, the vast majority, if not all of you. You live this, you experience this, you, this is you, okay? The rest you take for granted to a certain extent. 
How would you have the same familiarity with the previous list as you would with this list, is the question. So this is a picture I took out in the desert of Jordan, a sardine can in the desert. I just thought it was kind of cool. So I'm going to call it embracing the contradictions. Some things I've learned from my travels and interactions with, quote, others. So this is where I want to bring all this together, I hope. If it fails, eh, at least we tried. Here we go. First off, these are some things that I've learned. Don't commit the fallacy of induction. Don't stereotype. I know five people from New York. All five were jerks. Therefore, all New Yorkers are. Yeah, you already know the rest of the story. Don't do that. Go out there and experience for yourself. What field studies does is gives you an opportunity to actually immerse yourself, engage someone else, but to do it on their turf and in their terms. If you look at this, let's go back to Muslims for a minute. Um, <clears throat> I've spent the better part of my adult life working in Islamic societies, Indonesia and in the Middle East. Muslims are incredibly rich people. Um, let's look at this. There are 1.7 billion Muslims in the world. If 99.999% of them are good and wonderful people, which I believe they are, Islam is so big it leaves a million still who are not. That's how big Islam is. How many Mormons are there on the, in, the, in the world? Most liberal estimation, including the ones that were baptized in swimming pools. Awesome. <laughs> Let's just say 15 million. Okay? If you took, and this is just simply a matter of ratios, if you took all the whack jobs that Mormonism and all of its offshoots created, and you made us 1.7 billion people in the world, all the Wanda Barzees, all the Warren Jeffs, all the Lafferty brothers, we would be a very, very, very scary people. Your first response would be, but that's not us. That's a whole bunch of offshoots. Is Islam monolithic? Do the 99.99999% of the other Muslims condone what that other million would be doing? No. If somebody talks bad about Mormonism, is your first response to defend it? The faith. Yeah, why? Because you have a different perception of it, correct? You have a different context about it. And why do you have that different context and different perception? You live it. You experience it. It's part of you. It's part of what you identify with, and it's part of what identifies you. What if you could do the same? beyond just your Mormonism, or your Americanism, or whatever ism you've got? What if you could take all of these lenses and keep putting lens after lens after lens on and refract the light and the perceptions coming in that would allow you to see the world very, very differently? For example, <coughs> there are more Muslims in Indonesia than all the Arab world combined. 19% of Muslims, all Muslims, live in Indonesia. Only 18% of Muslims are Arabs. Yet when an American thinks of an Arab or a Muslim, what do they think of? They think of an Arab on the back of a camel with a bomb strapped to his chest out in the middle of a desert. I was in Jakarta, Indonesia last year in April presenting with three very, very prominent Muslim scholars. And they were all speaking English. It was kind of fun. So when it was my turn, I got up and I spoke Indonesian. I said, you guys are all speaking English, and as the only American white guy up here, I figure I better speak Indonesian. It was kind of fun. But I asked him this. I said, why is that the case? Why do Americans think of an Arab on the back of a camel with a bomb strapped to his chest? Why don't they think of a Jakarta businessman with a briefcase walking into his office? Why don't we? Media. That one, that point zero 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 one percent that 24-hour news cycle, how do we overcome a perception that has been given to us like I fed you a perception about that cow's head picture? That's what I think field studies and international experience exposure brings to you. You can pick up a newspaper and you can say BS, Boy Scouts, Baking Soda, Bloated Cheap, and Bold Sociology. Okay? You can look at it and just say, no, nah, that's not right. That just doesn't work. Okay? <coughs> So here's some things I've learned. Arab hospitality is very real. I've been going to Jordan for five years and I've never once bought a meal. 
They won't let me. I come home 20 pounds after three weeks, and I have to do something about it. I have to discover my inner Arab. I shaved before I came back to school. I got hugging and kissing lessons in the Badia, out in the Bedouin region of Jordan. This is my friend Schlash. And he told me that I'm not doing it right, so he had to teach me how to hug and kiss in, in Arab. A few years ago, I took a couple of students with me to Cambodia on one of my internships. Um, she's paralyzed from the waist down. AJ's her fiance. AJ took her everywhere in that wheelchair. Places that are not handicap friendly in any way, shape, or form. It was a great lesson to all of us of, of someone loving someone else enough to actually really sacrifice for a cause. A couple of other things I want to tell you about that I've learned about. Efficiency is more humane, more human in terms of its relationships than other things. We live in what I like to call a microwave society. If things aren't finished in 15 seconds, we're ticked off. We sit at an intersection and we're waiting for an opportunity to merge in and we start tapping our foot and go, if we've waited there for three seconds. We see a 13 millimeter slot, we gun it and we jump in. Okay, We want it now, we want it fast. What I've discovered in my travels is that a good percentage of the rest of the world understands that efficiency comes at a cost. And the one overriding thing I understand about Southeast Asia is that they will always take human relationships over efficiency. We get over there and we think, oh God, they're doing this so bass backwards. Why don't they just, uh. why? Because they're far more concerned about the human relationship than about being efficient. Bargaining, for example. Bargaining is not an economic relationship to a Southeast Asian. It is a human relationship. They are going to force you to deal with them as a human being before you can deal with them in an economic relationship. I have students every year come back and go, I hate bargaining. I say, well, stop thinking about it as an economic relationship. Ask them about their family. Ask them what they did today. Ask them what they like to do. And they always come back and go, it was so much fun. And it was, and then they always get their price. Other things, things that we constantly misrepresent. How many of you heard, have heard the United States referred to as the great Satan by, Muslim, by Muslims? Satan, by the way, is an Arabic word. It's not, a, it's not an English word. It comes into the English language after the Crusades. It's shaitan in, in Arabic. And it's the etymological root for a variety of things in English, including another word that sounds similar to shirt, but um, has another letter in there, or less of one letter in there, okay? It means dross or refuge, okay? It comes in, it's only mentioned three times in the Bible, and it's only in the King James Bible, and only in the New Testament. It's a word that came after the Crusades. And Satan to the Muslims, is the guy who doesn't get it. He's the great trivializer. He's not the embodiment of evil. That is a Christian concept. We hear him calling us the great saint, and we go, oh my goodness, why do they think we're so evil? They don't. They think we're trivial. They think we keep putting all of our priorities in the wrong spot. But we don't see it as they're saying it. We see it from our perspective with our lens, and we see it as, oh my goodness, they think we're evil. They think you're trivial. They think that we're always putting our eggs in the wrong basket. Another lesson that I've learned. Um, really quick, I'm almost out of time here. When I put students in host families in Southeast Asia, we talk about earning love. If a, stu if a family accepts a student, they already love you. It's a really hard concept for us to get. You don't earn their love, they love you. And they'll tell you and you go, how can that be? Um, it's a group-based society. It's not an individual-based society. It's not predicated upon merit in that regard. If they've said yes, you're in, period. And your Thai host mom will be far more anal about your activities at night than your real mom will be. If you go out after eight, she'll tell you that the night ninjas will get you. Okay, really fast. You've heard of research that talks about families that eat together, stay together. It's totally a Western concept. In Thailand now, a lot of families don't even have kitchens in their home. Ties don't eat together.
But there is no question whatsoever that they are together as a family. They are a group-based society. We are an individual-based society. We have to constantly, constantly devise ways to remind ourselves that we're also a group. In Southeast Asia, they have to re con contrive of ways to remind themselves that they can also be individualistic. And then they're all individualistic the exact same way. They all go buy Hello Kitty stuff, and um, they all dress up like they're dressing up in South, in South Korea today. And they're all being very individualistic exactly the same way. But a lot of this stuff you hear about families that eat together, stay together, it's very context specific. OK. I take the students to a uh, uh, Buddhist university in Chiang Mai. And the rector of the university has what he calls monkey mind. And he says, you guys are Americans. You all have monkey mind. Your mind is over here. It's over there. It's like a monkey. He's like, oh, my goodness. Oh, oh, oh. He said, your job is to take it easy. One of my favorite shows ever was the last show that Peter Sellers made, and it was called Being There, a very esoteric, very existential show. When I take you guys over Southeast Asia to Jordan with me, that's what I want you to be, is there. Just be there. You're not going to go change the world. Don't try. You're going to mess it up if you do. You're there to change you. And you're there to change you because you've opened up yourself and you've allowed yourself to be taught. So you're so you need to be there long enough to recognize what you have as Americans, but then long enough to recognize what you don't have as Americans. I'm going to skip past this part. OK? Um, I did want to show you this really fast, though, if I can. I won't take long. This is crossing the street in Ho Chi Minh City. So watch the lady cross the street trying to cross. Traffic doesn't stop. It's fun. Now wait for it. Watch for the, uh, as soon as this bus goes by, this van. OK, watch for the white guy on the uh, Segway. <laughs> OK, so the thing about this is, there's no such thing as road rage in Southeast Asia. Nobody pulls out a bow and arrow and shoots the other guy, which actually happened in Raytown, Missouri, in Kansas City a couple of years ago on Interstate 70. Somebody cut somebody off on an exit, chased him down. He had a crossbow in his car, and he shot the dude. Oops. Road rage doesn't happen in Southeast Asia. And the reason it doesn't happen in Southeast Asia is because we don't put our trust in rules there. We put our trust in individuals. We put our trust in people. And you're constantly working back and forth with each other like a school of fish, literally. Um, I get on my motorcycle. My whole point is to get where I'm going without ever putting my feet down. It's a really fun game. Um, but it works. If you stop at a stoplight and the hoser next to you doesn't, you're mad here in the United States because you stopped and they didn't. Because our trust are in the abstract rules. There, their trust is in each other. And they work across each other, and they bounce across each other, and it works. You rarely, if ever, see a head-on collision in Southeast Asia. You just don't see them. You see other kinds of collisions, but not head-on collisions. So to wrap this up, it's what I'm going to call the Spider-Man truism. With great power comes great responsibility. Or much is given, much is expected. You have an awful lot. But I would suggest that we don't just, we're not just grateful for what we have. It goes beyond that. When we do international opportunities, when you travel overseas, as Rick Steves calls it, he says travel's a political act. You expose yourself. You, let, you open yourself up, and you let yourself be immersed in the experience. It's not only the ability to see what you've got. More importantly, it's the ability to see what you don't have. And you bring that home, and you become far better world citizens. People who can read a newspaper and go, Ugh. OK? Or when somebody makes some weird comment in your elders' quorum or release society, you just go, no, that's not accurate. Don't, please. Um, so open it up. Expose yourself. Give the world a chance. Your odds are actually in your favor. Um, they're not working against you. In a 24-hour news cycle, you've got some pretty, pretty astronomical odds to actually make it onto the news. That's it. Thanks, Steve. <laughs>